Well, hello and welcome to today's session uh, on immersive retail, connected shopping in a new era. My name is Kevin O'Malley. I'm the moderator for today. I'm president and co-founder of Tech Talk Studio. We have two amazing panels here today that I'll be interviewing, but mostly they'll just be bouncing off of each other. Uh, our first panelist is Roxy. Tony's a virtual reality pioneer, a serial entrepreneur. He's an author and an angel investor and total rock star. Tony's developed international standards and protocols and sold technology companies. He's currently head of AR VR ad innovation at Unity Technologies, where he oversees Unity strategies for virtual and augmented reality and exper experiential marketing and advertising. I've spoken with Tony three times now at South by every time is just amazing. He is a wild musician and a, a total pioneer in the VR world. I'm very honored to be on stage with him. And for my first time ever at South by a beautiful German genius, Silke Meixner, is partner of global business strategy at IBM Global Business. Silke is another rock star, uh, and she's recognized as a leading digital business strategist, helping CMO to achieve digital transformation through digital marketing business and brand strategies that drive end-to-end -end customer experiences. That's her work currently at IBM. But Silke started her career developing new revenue growth platforms for leading companies such as Universal Studios, eToys, and Deloitte before joining IBM's digital strategies. So we're gonna start with uh, three or four minutes from Tony, uh, kind of what we talked about, a state of immersive, how tech will transform everything, how we do and shop online and in person. And then Silke will come from there. This panel started out really when we didn't think it was gonna be quite the same situation we had the last year. Originally we had a lot more focus on how is in person going to change with VR and AR, but things clearly have changed. But so we're looking at the short term, how have things changed, but really the long term too. What are things going to be like over the next five to 10 years? So Tony, why don't you kick it off first? Yeah, sure thing, Kevin. And it's great to be back with you uh, back in the saddle again. It gets better every year when we do this. And uh, and my dear buddy Silka, it's, uh, it's great to be able to do a South by session with you. I'm so excited to be here. So uh, in case folks don't know what Unity does, we are the leading 3D content creation platform. Uh, people make real-time 3D applications with our software forged in gaming for over the first decade of the company's existence. But for the last several years, it's been a platform to power augmented and virtual and all the, our, all the uh, realities uh, interactively across a bunch of industries. Uh, that includes automotive, architecture, filmmaking, and many others. Uh, my purview is around advertising and advertising is really the flip side of e-commerce when it comes to digital. And so I've been looking for the last several years now at how 3D technology can drive uh, interactive sales of products online. This was something that felt a bit luxurious a few years ago, uh, a vitamin, if you will, if you know the metaphor. But during the era of COVID, it's become a painkiller as retailers uh, could not present their wares in physical stores anymore. Um, there was so much going on with lockdown and uh, people who were selling their products needed to reach folks digitally in a way they didn't before. So now I'm, imagine uh, 3D digital twins of physical items, everything from a complex item like a, a car, which would be a very considered purchase if you did it online, to something simple like a piece of consumer electronics or a home appliance like a coffee maker or accessories, handbags, eyewear. Uh, these things can all be represented with varying degrees of fidelity in 3D. So imagine uh, models of these kind of products delivered online in websites and applications, um, showing up in advertising context, digitally ad units within a social platform or in search. So imagine all those things having a 3D equivalent, not just an image, and a consumer being able to interact with those, uh, learn more about the products, possibly share these things with their friends. Um, all of these technologies are now being looked at really um, with a lot of scrutiny to see if they can help um, sell products. And early returns are looking pretty good. There's been some initial forays and experiments, uh, folks like Shopify, YouTube, showing off interactive try-ons of products or trying out what things look like in your house. Um, for example, a piece of furniture. And a lot of that technology, um, a lot of the technology that powers that has been uh, coming from Unity. So companies like uh, House and Ikea, for example, have used the Unity engine to create applications that show off products and then let you try them out in your house. 
And so this is a really exciting time that I think has been massively accelerated by the pandemic. Kevin, which I assume we're going to unpack uh, throughout this conversation. All right. Thanks, Tony. That's great. Uh, Silka, now we had talked about maybe if you could give us an introduction to retail omnichannel for 2021 and beyond and some of how this has been redefined by COVID in terms of the marketing imperative but also maybe some of the insights from your clients at IBM and the things that you're seeing there. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. And I think Tony mentioned it uh, uh, quite, quite significantly that shift from a luxury of having um, any product uh, rendered in a virtual environment that wasn't nice to have. And now it is almost essential to some of the businesses. So, uh, what Tony was mentioning, the idea that you bring an immersive experience into uh, the digital world has almost overnight become top of the agenda for many of the marketers that we're working with. Um, so a couple of factors that play into this. Number one is uh, the question, will this be temporarily or will this change ultimately how we interact as brands with our, uh, with our consumers or customers? The answer we give to our clients across different sectors is it's here to stay. So that idea that it's no longer a luxury, but a necessity is very much a reality. What that means is also for marketers as well as technologists and anyone who has an IT budget to make the decision where to place the right bets. So across the different sectors, we have seen um, the retail environment being a pioneer. Um, there is the need, as Tony mentioned, to put a furniture rendering into the virtual environment. Um, also in retail or hospitality and leisure, you want to actually immerse yourself in the experience now, maybe even more than before, because people don't travel right now. They don't get the chance to go to the outlets. So what marketers, as well as the technologists we're working with a lot ask us is, help us with a roadmap. What functions and what features should we put online first um, versus maybe half a year from now or a year from now. So a lot of the retail industry is looking into the omni-channel experience to be as seamless as possible. So you might in your pre-shopping experience look and research, but you then immediately want to be able to see what it looks like you know, in the virtual environment. So creating that seamless experience is top of mind for many marketers. The other one that we'll probably touch on as well is personalization. If I live on my mobile device, but I also have a laptop, I work from home, I tend to do the shopping as well as the exploration. I don't want to be logging into different systems. I want to have a very seamless omni-channel experience. So those two trends we see um, continued well beyond this year. And they also set the way for additional experiences. So Tony already touched on it. Not only do I want to anticipate um, a destination that I go to or see the store before I might be able to go there in person and be recognized as an individual, I also want to be able to share that. So content in itself is no longer just a push model from the brands to the consumer, but gets created together with the consumer. So the technical intricacies of making that happen is very much on most marketers and technologists agenda for this year, as well as beyond. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I, I wonder a question for both of you. So clearly COVID is a com right now is a combination of challenges, but also new opportunities. So how, I know companies have had to pivot, but how much of what's happening now was already in place and how have people who are successful now how were they already prepared and who was caught unprepared and changing fast? And how, what's the combination of brand new, but what was already in the works and people who had the foresight to prepare for something like this? Silke, let's start with you, please. Yeah, well, foresight, I don't think anyone understood the magnitude uh, of ultimately the pandemic, but many had already anticipated that there needs to be uh, the opportunity to virtualize uh, the uh, the setting in which we deliver our products and service in the marketing. So what I found um, is retailers who had already thought about maybe virtualizing their many outlets uh, a lot faster than ever before um, was, the, was the need to pivot. Um, so we, we had a, a large global retailer very much pivot from a few stores that were not accessible to actually a global rollout. So scaling 
and making uh, that a scalable model that would be sustained was top of mind. What that necessitated was um, agile working principles. So many of the marketers and the technologists that we're dealing with are used to um, having an outcome and drive a first proof of concept what they scale quickly. So that has accelerated quite a bit. Um, in other cases, the idea is that you want to de-risk your investment. So that's the investment in the technology as well as in the marketing delivery. Start very small and contain the risk and then go from that proof case to other units, to other products or services. That by and large has been what helped a lot of the marketers and technologists over the past year and is a principle that will continue to do well simply because the pace of technology changes, capacity and bandwidth changes. So that's ultimately a principle that many of our clients benefit and actually scale and maintain. Tony, what do you think? Oh, well, all of that. Um... And I just, I guess I would say that we had all heard it prophesized the uh, retail apocalypse coming, as they called it, uh, where the brick and mortar stores were, some of them were very troubled. You know, how, how do we get people back in our stores and the larger malls were saying the same thing. How do we get people in? How do we get footfalls? This was already something that was a dire situation for a lot of these retailers. And the pandemic uh, made that so pronounced. And so... Folks who are already planning on a certain amount of digital transformation have managed to find ways to reach their customers during this uh, terrible period. Uh, those that did not, I mean, maybe the writing was on the wall for some of these retailers anyway. There's some that have not survived. There's, there's a few large name retailers that shuttered in 2020, and that was probably largely accelerated by uh, the pandemic, but it was already happening. So I, I think and, and uh, some folks have famously uh, said this before, and I, the name escapes me, but if it comes back, I'll get to it in a, in a bit here, Kevin, that folks who are making five-year plans around this kind of stuff during the pandemic, they were urged to make those, you know, execute those plans now. They're no longer five-year plans. Put them into play immediately or as soon as you can. So pandemic accelerated many, many things that were already in play. Hey, Tony, one more question for you. Uh, Unity is very big in gaming and, and also a lot of things happening with 3D beyond VR. But how much will gaming and, and, and entertainment all together infiltrate retail right now? Are we going to find a world now that's totally different from, from how we grew up where you had the show, then the commercials, and then the show? I mean, what, what's going to be happening with that? And I think after that, Silka, how do you see that relating to personalization? So. But Tony, if you could just address that to start. All right, it's a, such a multifaceted answer. I'm gonna try and weave that into say a minute of an answer and I don't know how well I'm gonna do. So uh, first of all, game technology is definitely um, starting to transform lots and lots of enterprises beyond the game industry. Uh, the investments that were made to make compelling interactive content were first supported by the game industry where you know those uh, cons those uh, creators needed this kind of technology to deliver these kind of experiences. And that's what Unity built its business on again for the first decade of its existence. But as this technology has become low cost, reaches all devices, has become easier and easier to create with tools like the Unity platform, we're now seeing all these other industries embrace it. No reason to expect that that's not going to be true for retail and that it will in fact, spatial computing, immersive tech, however you wanna frame that, is going to transform the retail experience with these 3D digital twins, um, you know, across a bunch of different channels that I mentioned already, search in, um, and in applications and websites. But interestingly, you could also flip the script, Kevin, and say, how's retail going to invade gaming with these new mega platforms like Fortnite and Roblox and these large communities of people communicating in real time? The other trend we're going to see is those 3D products will reach consumers in those venues as well. It's not all just going to be showing up in search results and 2D web pages. So I think we're going to see a complete convergence of these two endeavors over the next three to five years. That's great. Well, Silka, what about personalization from you and your clients? And, and what, what keeps these people awake at night that you're working with, the, the clients that you guys have? Yeah, good question. Um, on personalization, it is um, a tremendous opportunity and our clients who are, you know, big brands, uh, multinational global brands, 
the marketers have been thinking about personalization from for a long, long time. And it often is, of course, embedded into the ability to, to, to have good data, to have a good data structure. If that is a given or if that is being worked on, what I see a lot and what we have clients come and wonder is, how do I now take this idea of a personalized experience and make it much, much more bespoke and much more organic? Um, meaning that, of course, when we think about, uh, you know, virtualizing an environment or giving a sneak preview of an experience ahead of time, it can't be just a simple little video vignette. It has to be multi-sensory. It has to be engaging. And for many of the brands that we're working with, it also has to be fun content. So thinking about, you know, the data that is powerful and gives the marketers an opportunity to make the content more bespoke, more interactive, and also getting feedback from that interactivity. So when you have at every touch point along that consumer journey, the ability to look into what was working well, um, do we have feedback and data on what um, our consumers engaged with is input for the marketer. Then it's the opportunity to also test what kind of material content wise is maybe more relevant for certain audience segments in some cases, though, all the way down to the individual level, truly personalized. And then at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, now there is an interaction. The brands are seeking the social media interaction. Content gets created by the users and consumers. Um, and that woven into the consumer journey is one of the key principles to get right as a marketer. So you have marketers um, both laying awake at night out of sheer opportunity to really hit the right marks along the consumer journey, but also to use the data um, that makes this a more, very bespoke experience uh, appear more seamless and less uh, based on the device or the interaction mode. Um, all in though, I think it is uh, a great opportunity that is opening up ways to engage with brands also on a much more emotional level. So beyond the technology and beyond the, um, the virtual reality setting, to have that emotional connection to the brand and have that enabled through really something that's worth talking about or worth sharing is ultimately where the key is for a lot of the retailers that we're talking with. Yeah, Kevin, great, I, can I can I pick up on two or three of these threads here? I'm, I'm dying to jump in. Oh, yeah. I'm so with Silka on this and I want to amplify a few things. You mentioned fun, Silka. I mean, we'd be remiss in not talking about the fact that video game technology is high production value. It's bringing you Hollywood and cinematic quality experiences that, as you said, are emotionally engaging, you know, right to the device that you have. And then that is a huge component of this. Well, while the utility is ultimately what brings the marketer and the customer together, it's the, the customer engagement is all about the fun and that emotional connection. And 3D technology is going to play a huge part in that. And we're already seeing that in, in how, how engaged people get with these uh, pieces of content based on our experience in interactive 3D ads some of the stats that Shopify is showing about how this seems to lift uh, um, people uh, adding to cart if they can interact with a 3D model and then turn the camera on. So that's a big part of it. And the other part you mentioned, Silka, is agency, personal, personalization. Consumers these days want a heck of a lot more control over what they're doing, their story, how it's perceived in the world. So those are all great points you made, and I, I am fully aligned with those. That's great. Well, hey, Tony, do you think now, from your point of view, our, we've been talking about this for a while. Are stores going to go away or are they going to go the way of the, the whip and buggy or are they going to come back the way we used to know them or is it going to be something radically new that we don't even recognize anymore? And, I, and I'm talking about not just immediate COVID times, but in the long run. How is this all going to play out? Well, okay. this is the fun part of being a futurist because whatever I say, no one's going to call me on this in five years. But here is... <laughs> Here's my uh, thought. I don't think stores are going to go away. Um, I think, especially right now, I think we're all realizing what we're missing by not being able to go into a physical venue to the extent that we would like. That said, I think they are going to transform. And we were seeing the beginnings of this pre-pandemic with um, experiences like the Capital One Cafe. So we're talking retail now about financial services, but it's not just a bank branch you go into. It's a place where you go hang out. It is a lifestyle destination. So we may see more of a trend toward that. The, the retail outlet or mall being an experience center, 
uh, a place to hang, uh, maybe more of a bespoke and expert consultation uh, center, less about just, you know, acquisition fulfillment, because, you know, Amazon and digital services can do some of that so well at the speed of thought now, much more about connecting and experiencing in person. And I got to hazard a guess that as soon as the pandemic's in the rear view mirror, we're going to over index and overcompensate for being in person and being in social venues. So don't count bricks and mortar out, but I do think they're going to change. I think okay, well, here's a question. Go ahead, Zolka. Just a quick one. Um, Tony often does that. He sparks great dialogue. Um, I also believe, um, and we talked about this in the past, that it, it transcends the, brand, the brands. There is more brand interaction. You can have uh, retail destinations that are both virtual and real and brands actually interacting and having a, a new alchemy of how they come together. Um, those are certainly new and futuristic ways that I'm looking forward to. And I was wondering if you see some of that in the marketplace as well, Tony. Uh, yeah, always. It's just so hard to, it's hard to characterize and categorize uh, serendipity and emergent behavior. But you know, if we can get to the vision that you and I have, Silka, of this media type being fluid and universally accessible, um, we're going to see new experiences that integrate physical and digital, transcend the categories that we have been, you know, talking within right now. And, you know, I, we come out the other end of a mirror when that happens. I, you know, we don't know what to call it yet. But I absolutely see, you know, between the omni-channel, between the experiential, the physical digital convergence, entertainment and retail blurring, you know, what is that going to look like, Silka, in three or four years? Don't know. <laughs> okay, well, we're we're on a kind of a short time here. We're almost done with our session today, but this is South by Southwest, but we need to look at the future, but we need to look at what's really, really cool right now. So closing question for each of you, let's start with Silka and then finish with Tony. What is the coolest single or, or more than one thing what is the coolest hottest technology you're working on or using right now that we've never even seen before that's going to blow everyone's minds Ooh, that's a tough one coming from uh what i'm getting to see and experience every day but um i'll try i'll try to give you one of the coolest um we have quite a bit of work um, in terms of, as you know, you know, augmented reality, but also the overlay with um, cognitive uh, enablement and facial recognition. So especially in the retail space, um, some of the work that has been done by various technology groups, IBM and also collaborations have been to bring the ability to uh, take facial recognition, object recognition um, for security of you know retail spaces um but also to really have fun and make sure that what you get to try on or you know in a virtual environment is is truly bespoke to you so i like the idea of um this blending of different forms um that make it so real and so um enjoyable for our consumers to ultimately go into a virtual store um, move objects around, um, change their mind on the color, maybe also, you know, chatting with friends while they're doing that and doing that with an avatar, avatar or as themselves. Um, those are really exciting opportunities uh, to bring some of these different technology streams together. And I know we're out of time. Um, the other one that I always love to talk about is the weather, um, because there's an overlay of, you know, the the weather data that makes it even more relevant. Um, so you can actually also uh, look into the modalities of whether it's rain or shine, uh, what your virtual reality looks like in the retail environment or beyond. That's beautiful. Thank you. Tony, can you wrap us up in just about a minute? I know yeah, that's I'll not try. a lot. Uh, playing, playing off of what Silka was talking about with facial recognition in a similar vein. And I, I can't talk about stuff that I can't talk about yet, but I can. I can identify things that maybe people aren't paying enough attention to. We talk a lot about 3D rendering when we talk about uh, VR, AR and all that, but there's a flip side on the augmented reality side, which is computer vision. And the camera, that device you have, and eventually a pair of glasses, being able to recognize things in the real world, find things like them, you know, the implications for retail. I like that piece of clothing. Where do I get something like it? Just by pointing your phone. Visual search, powered by computer vision, machine learning, you know, a 5G backbone, that's where that's where the excitement's gonna be the next three or so years. That's great, thank you, Tony. But we're out of time. 
Silke Mexner, Tony Parisi, Sci-Fi Southwest 2021. Thank you very much. We hope we'll see you next year in person back in Austin. Thank you for a wonderful session today. Thank you Thank very you, much. Kevin.